While we're talking about Genesis, and before we tackle the god-awful Calling All Stations album, I think we should talk about the pre abacab Genesis. Yes, we'll be reviewing every album that I own of theirs before Abacab, and the first album up for that is a favorite of mine, probably my second or third favorite Genesis album ever, and one that, in my mind, perfectly blends the two sides of Genesis. The poppy, sappy adult contemporary stuff, drenched in synths and inspiring a lot of 80s pop, and the pretentious progressive elements. Yes, Siri, this is an album I've talked about four or five times in the show. This is Genesis Duke. Duke was the first Genesis album I ever picked up, and it remains to this day my favorite album of the Phil Collins era of the band. Um, and hands down, it is the best 80s Genesis album. Um, I like Avocab. I'm okay with the Yellow Shapes album, and I like a lot of Invisible Touch, but this is the mo the best one. This is, to me, this is the last amazing Genesis album. Abacab is good, but this is the last amazing one. It also, to me, has the best cover of any of the 80s Genesis album. I mean, Abacab has this weird abstract thing for the cover. Um... Invisible Touch has a horrible album cover. I, this is about as dated and 80s looking as you can get. Um, the Yellow Shapes album is okay, but it's fucking Yellow Shapes. Whereas, to me, there's something kind of deep, even, even in, in the very cartoony, minimalistic sense, about this guy standing by him this curiously malformed figure standing by himself with the windows open staring up into the night sky and it kind of sets the tone for th for this whole album it's i wouldn't say it's one of the best genesis covers but to me it is it's i mean yeah something like foxtrot or nursery crime has a better album cover but i like this one I don't. I really don't know why, though. And as I've said, musically, we'll 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 get into that in the review. I have reviewed this album three times now. The first one was one of the very first reviews I ever did. I don't know if anybody saw it. It was it during my early like, "Hi guys, I'm New Kamal One Two Three. I'm gonna talk into the camera. Only it's super blurry because I have a Dell and." Dell fucking sucks. And I didn't even have the CD at that time. I had it on iTunes. And then the second one, which I'm not going to delete the way I did the first one, because the first one, if nothing else, would be funny to see now. The second one is good for when it was made. It's pro actually probably one of my better reviews from that those early talking into the camera without any kind of track by track or really having any of the music in the video days i would say it's one of the best video along with the their satanic majesties review i would say it's one of the best reviews i did from that time but it's still not very good and so today i'm going to try to do it as best as I can, and hopefully this will satisfy. It's become like a little tradition that every time I have a significant leap in the way that I do the style of these videos, I re end up redoing the Duke review. But hopefully this will be the final one, and I don't see any other way to do it than to just get down to it and review this album. Track one, Behind the Lines. The album opens up with one of the strongest intro songs in the Genesis discography. It, at first, it's bombastic, progressive, and openly announces the album's presence to everybody. But then it kind of changes it up and starts getting more piano and keyboard driven and even a little funky in places. And then it goes into the vocal part. And now the vocal part of the song is pretty cool. I'm not really sure what the lyrics are about. I do know that Behind the Lines, along with the first three songs on this album, was supposed to be the 
beginning section of a massive, sidelong, bombastic, progressive rock epic. It would have been like Supper's Ready, but they rejected it, and so they parceled out the songs throughout the entirety of the album. The, the first three songs on the album are part of it. Turn It On Again is, is another. And then the last two songs would have been the finale. What it was about, going to be about, nobody really knows. But this song is a fantastic intro and one of my favorite Genesis songs. Don't you know everything must be prepared for the Duchess? Duchess begins with a really interesting drum machine intro that drags on a little bit, but is a pretty good, it's a pretty good song once you get into it. The lyrics are really interesting though. They tell the story of a female pop star that kind of mirrors the story of Genesis itself actually, because she starts off young, caring about the music, not caring what other people are thinking about. And then over the years, they start. she starts caring more and more about what people think, trying to please the fans of the music more than caring about the music itself. And in the end, nobody wants her anymore. Kind of ironic that it mirrors the story of the band in such a way. But it's a great song. I will say the intro and outro are a little bit too long for me, but what's in between is amazing, so I can forgive it. Don't worry about it, man. This is just the guide vocal. <laughs> guide vocal is basically just Phil Collins singing over some piano. Like a lot of the Duke suite, its exact meaning is very open to interpretation. It could be about some force or person who has been leading the protagonist on. Or it could be a lover or something else. I don't really know. Whatever it is, it's a cool song and it gets an awesome reprise later on in Duke's Travels. He is a man of all times. Wait, does that mean he has shitty hair? Beginning the more poppy, non-Duke sweet songs of the album, Man of Our Times has a really cool drum beat, a really awesome sort of anthemic chorus, and I just really like it. Um, it's got a weird sound and it's despite being kind of poppy it's not that accessible at all um although humorously i feel like they re reused some of the lyrics for this song from for tonight 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 on invisible touch but that's just a theory track five misunderstanding one of only two Phil Collins solo songs on the album, Misunderstanding is often hated and reviled by hardcore Genesis fans as sort of the start of darkness for the band and the gradual takeover of the Phil Collins style adult contemporary songs, but I actually don't hate it. I think it's a nice catchy pop song. And anyway, the real contender for start of darkness is Follow You, Follow Me from and then there were three, and if you really want to go back, then it would be Mike Rutherford on your own special way for Wind and Wuthering. Track 6, Heath Hayes. <laughs> when I first got this album, I didn't like Heath Hayes very much at all. But over the years, I've come to love it as one of the two progress real progressive rock songs on this album that weren't part of the Duke suite originally. And it takes a while to get going, but once it does, it's pretty good. And the lyrics, again, weird, don't really know what it's talking about besides being the feeling of being out of place in a strange and alien land. But whatever, it's a pretty good song. Billy the damn TV went off, come in here and turn it on again. One of the real standout tracks from this album, Turn It On Again was originally just a short interlude in the larger Duke suite until the band members realized how good and catchy it was and make, added some extra lyrics and made it its own song. Lyrically, it's kind of weird. It's about a guy who is like mentally disturbed in some way and in love with a character on the TV show. And yeah, it's kind of weird like that. Arguably more relevant than ever today than it was back in the 80s. <laughs> I'm alone tonight. Just me and the whiskey. Alone Tonight by Mike Rutherford is a sappy kind of song about not having anybody to spend your nights with that I should hate, but I don't. And it's not even in a guilty pleasure way that I like the song. Unlike on Invisible Touch, 
We Can't Dance, or the Yellow Shapes album, they actually make the Sappy Love Ballads work here. I don't know what it is, they just seem to work better on this album. I swear to God, George, if we go around this cul-de-sac one more time, we're stopping for direction. Cul-de-sac is a Tony Banks song, and it's the other token frog song, not allied with the Duke Sweet, on this album, and it's a little more mixed, much like he pays. I didn't like this song when I first got the album, but again, much like he pays, over the years, I've grown to enjoy it. Lyrically, it seems to be about armies marching off to war in search of death and not questioning their superiors, but to be honest, I don't think the lyrics are out of Track 10, Please Don't Ask. Please Don't Ask is another sappy song that I happen to love. I don't know why, I have a tendency to really love songs, and I've talked about this before, that people hate with a passion, like the Seesaw song from Saucer Full of Secrets. But I rap it, or for a Genesis example, More Fool Me, and um, that Phil Collins song from Nursery Crime. But here, I really like it. It probably wouldn't sound as good if anybody but Phil Collins tried to pull it off, but somehow, he manages to pull off this song. Track 11, Duke's Travels Air. Probably my favorite post-Gabriel epic progressive rock song, and a very strong contender for favorite Genesis song of all time. Duke's Travels is mostly instrumental, clocking in at around 8 minutes. And for the first half, it's mostly a synth-driven jam, beginning on kind of a weak note, and then going into a really amazing sort of tribal African drum beat before permutating into other forms, dilly-dallying in there for a little while, really picking up speed around the halfway point. And until in one of what is for me one of the classic Genesis moments, the there's a short little guitar solo by Mike Rutherford, which is one of my favorite Genesis guitar solos. I know it's not anything like as amazing as Steve Hackett, but I still love it. The song bursts into a reprise of guide vocal that is somehow incredibly powerful, even though the lyrics are almost completely meaningless. And the song just keeps, really kind of slows down at that point, going into a more melodic passage and then segueing into the next song. Track 12, Duke's End. Duke's End is one of the very best album closers I think I've ever heard. It blends the themes of Behind the Lines, Turn It On Again, and Guide Vocal into one, and ends it in an appropriately bombastic way. You can question as to what the exact meaning of it. I have often taken it as the protagonist of the hypothetical Duke suite has reached the end of their journey and perhaps the end of their life as a whole. And as such, it's a very bittersweet sort of, on the one hand, bombastic and joyous, and on the other hand, somewhat melancholy piece. Because it begins with the beginning, same beginning from behind the lines before going into some guitar solo-y bits and again mostly stuff from behind the lines and then it goes into reprises of turn it on again and then it also reprises bits from the end of behind the lines and finally it ends with the theme from turn it on again with one of the guitar solos from behind the lines and it fades out with the ending of guide vocal playing in an end to what is for me the absolute best Phil Collins era Genesis album and one of my favorite Genesis albums on the whole. As the number of times that I have reviewed and re-reviewed this album should attest, Duke is one of my absolute favorite Genesis albums. For me, it's the very best they ever released during the Phil Collins era. I mean, Abacab comes close in terms of enjoyability for me, but really the key word for Duke and the reason I enjoy it, Duke, as much as I do, and the reason that I do not enjoy things like We Can't Dance and Yellow Shapes and Invisible Touch, or even Avocab to the same degree that I do Duke, 
it all comes down to one word, consistency. This is the last consistently good Genesis album where they don't mar the album with horrible attempts at adult contemporary and god-awful failed experiments like Who Done It on Abacab and Silver Rainbow on the Yellow Shapes album and about half of the running time of We Can't Dance. And it's, it's simple. The adult contemporary kind of isn't there because Phil Collins hadn't gotten huge when this album came out the way he had, even when like Abacab and the Yellow Shapes album were released. And the pop on this album is actually really good. Um, I mean, yeah, if you're not a huge fan of 80s cheese, as with Abacab, you're not going to enjoy a lot of this. And I will say, and, and then there were three in Duke, are night and day. If you can't accept a little 80s in your Genesis, you're going to hate Duke. But on the other hand, as I said, it's more consistent than and then there were three. And you don't have problems like having a fairly progressive album that jumps out of nowhere with a very poppy song at the end the way you do on and then there were three so overall duke holds an extremely special place in my heart as the po the favorite phil collins era genesis album and the the first genesis album i ever bought with my own money if you want to get into the phil collins era genesis you want to get into 80s genesis this is an album, hell, you want to get into Genesis as a whole, this is an album you need to pick up. I hope you don't, we won't be disappointed. I certainly wasn't. So anyway, check out the band. No, seriously, they're an awesome band. Like, they're probably my second favorite band ever. But, yeah, listen to Genesis. Have a nice day.